cry freedom from the chains that bind your children freedom from the chains that bind our praise to you freedom from the lies of the enemy freedom we cry
You are 
stand, please? <clears throat> I want everybody in the building for the next moment or so to have a hand laid on their body, preferably men with men, ladies with ladies, but if not, of course, men with their wives or their children. But I want everybody to have a hand laid on them, and I want us to release a spirit of healing in the house because I sense right now the Lord wants to heal some people in the sanctuary. Matter of fact, go ahead right now and just yield to that presence of healing. Will you do that? Just lay hands on one another and begin to pray and ask for a release of healing in the house. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We bind sickness in the name of Jesus Christ. We bind sickness in the name of Jesus. Right now we bind it. We lose the spirit of healing in the house. Woo. Wow. Feel that. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, I bind sickness, I bind disease, I bind pain, I bind torment. Woo! We release a spirit of healing, restoration, wholeness. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name, who forgiveth all thy transgressions, who heals all thy sicknesses and diseases. Hallelujah. Change partners right quick and pray for somebody all over again, brand new. Hallelujah. Just release the spirit of healing. There's some folks here tonight that needs this. Come on. Right there at home or riding down the road in your car, join hands. We release the spirit of healing to come on you in your car, in your house. Those of you listening by the internet, I speak to the spirit of healing be released in your homes, in your offices, in your automobiles. Ooh, freedom, freedom in the powerful name of Jesus, the King, the Lord, Jehovah Rapha, the Lord, your healer. Ooh, friend, feel that. Hey, Holy Ghost. Take me past the outer courts into the whole the brazen altar Lord I long to see your face pass me by the crowds of people and the priests who sing their praise I hunger and thirst for your righteousness but it's only found one place so take me Yeah. 
Take me past the outer courts Into the holy place Past the brazen altar Lord, I want to see your face Pass me by the crowds of people And the priests who sing their praise I hunger and thirst for your righteousness But it's all I've found one place God of wonders 
stars beyond our galaxy You are holy Holy The universe declares your majesty You are holy Holy God of wonders beyond our galaxy What it would be like when I walk by your side. I could only imagine what my eyes will see when your face it is before me. I could only imagine. I can only imagine what it will be like when I walk by your side. I can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face it is before me. I could only imagine Oh, I could only imagine That's right 
surrounded by your glory, Lord. Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus? Or in all of you be still? Will I stand in your presence? To my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak it all I can only imagine? Oh, I can only imagine. I can only imagine when that day comes and I find myself. Surrounded by your glory. I'm surrounded by your glory. What will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus? Or in all of you be still? Will I stand in your presence? To my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak? Yeah. 
song of all songs. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Go ahead, bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, bless the Lord, bless the Lord. We bless you, Jesus. We bless you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Go ahead just for a moment and just continue to bless him. It's all right. Just take a moment. So raba raba shure de de bebe andoro basando. Kira ra ra basando ro lo borre de de bebe andoro ra basando. Hala basato re bebe ando basando yo lo bayando. Bless the Lord, bless the Lord, bless the Lord, bless the Lord. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. You are the great God. There is none beside thee, Lord. Hallelujah. You are the almighty God, the God of heaven and the God of earth. There's none above thee. And we exalt and magnify your holy name. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Bless the Lord. Well, you're stuck with me tonight, friends. I'm sorry about that. And I'm not going to waste any time. I'm going to go ahead and get right to it. My heart and my mind is so full of stuff that the Lord has given me. I mean, it is so full. I'm just seeing things that the Lord is revealing to me. And I know beyond any doubt that it's in preparation for what God is going to do. Amen? Amen. Turn with me in your Bibles. To the book of First Peter. How many of you brought your Bibles? Let me see them. Wow. Man, that's wonderful. If you have your Bible, stand up. <clears throat> Want to see it? If you don't have your Bible, now's the time to blush. Everybody stand for the reading of the Word of God. First, First Peter chapter 3. I'm going to continue on with blessings tonight. Last, last time I spoke on a Friday night, I was amazed. We got just a lot of email a lot of letters, a lot of telephone calls it just amazed me at the response we got off of that. So I've decided to take it a little bit further. Is that okay? Man, I tell you, I'm just seeing some stuff. I wish it was Sunday so I could go ahead and continue my message on God's first. How many of you were here and heard that? God's first. I preached part one. I've got probably about two more parts to go. And man, I'm excited about that. I wish it was Sunday so I could do that right now. Well, I might do it. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> first Peter chapter three and verse eight. He says, finally, be ye all of one mind. Everybody say that. Be ye all of one mind. He also said, have compassion one of another and love as brethren and be pitiful, be courteous, 
Don't render evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrawise, blessing. And look at this. There's a semicolon there. It says, knowing that you are thereunto called, that you should inherit a blessing. Say that with me, that you should inherit. Say it again. Inherit a blessing. All right, you may be seated. We're going to keep your Bibles out because I'm going to be going to a lot of stuff. Is that all right? It's unusual to do that in a revival service, but hey, that's just the way I am. Can't help but do it. I, I feel like the Bible preaches itself better than anything else anyway. In the last meeting that we had, I talked to everybody and I shared with you and told you how that before revival broke out at Brownsville, if someone were to ask me, Pastor, what was the number one prerequisite for revival at Brownsville, I would say without a doubt, it was prayer. If someone were to say to me, what do you think was the second prerequisite for revival at Brownsville, I would say beyond any doubt, it was what, it was something that God revealed to me that changed me, and it, after it touched me and changed me, it had effect on Brownsville. And it was understanding, getting a better understanding of the mystery and the power of a blessing. Now tonight, I'm going to sort of zigzag. <clears throat> I'm going to talk about curses, and I'm going to talk about blessings in the same message. I didn't do that the last time. But I'm going to talk about curses and blessings in the same message. Now here is where a lot of preachers sort of back up and they don't want to talk about this because it's controversial. I've never been one to be known to draw back from a controversial uh, topic. I'm not going to draw back from it now because I feel like that you need to hear what the Word of God says. Amen? Amen. You really need to hear it. And the Word of God will preach itself. This is not something that I'm making up. It's not something that I'm going to twist and introduce to you as some kind of a strange doctrine, but it's the Word of God, and the Word of God preaches itself better than anything else. Now, how many of you tonight know beyond any doubt whatsoever that you are a born-again child of God, you're Christian? Can I see your hand, please? That looks like almost everybody here. Now, Here's the first thing I want to say to you. Because many of you know that you're Christians and you've repented of your sins, you know that your, your sin life and your past has been canceled and it's been under the blood. It's been under the blood. But there's something that I want to point out to you. The Bible says, Cursed is he that hangs upon a tree. The Lord hung upon Calvary on a tree, and he became cursed for us. He took upon our sins, took upon himself our sins, paid the price, shed his blood on Calvary, and he canceled the debt of sin over our lives. But now, the Bible says this. God said, I set before you life and death. He said, Say it out loud, choose, choose life. And then he said, blessings and curses, and he said, choose blessings. I think sometimes people feel like that just because they become a Christian and get their debt canceled under the blood, I think they just feel like sometimes that uh, they don't have to pray and they don't have to choose. It's just like, well, now that I've become a Christian, I don't have to really do anything. I'm a Christian, and I don't have to watch my mouth, and I don't really have to um, discipline myself in any way. Oh, I'm a Christian. I'm going to heaven. But I believe that your life is going to be a series of choosings. And he said, choose life, and he said, choose blessings. Before revival broke out at Brownsville, I began to preach week by week 
a series of sermons entitled The Mystery and the Power of a Blessing. And I covered that really extensively the last time I spoke. Tonight, I don't want to go back into that so much as I want to deal with blessings again, but I also want to talk about the curses part also. I think probably when we get to heaven, we start, we're singing the song there a while ago about when we get to heaven, will I be able to stand in his presence? Will I be able to do these things when I get to heaven? And I think that we'll go through some of those emotions when we get to heaven. But I think probably the greatest thing that will happen to us when we get to heaven is the sensation of being completely free from satanic influence. Completely free from satanic influence. You talking about freedom. All stuff is gone. And you're talking about light and free and worship, uninhibited worship, and wisdom and flowing in knowledge and wisdom and reverence and awe and all those things. We have been born into this planet. And in sin, the Bible said that our mothers conceive us. And we were born here and I don't think that we really have any kind of an idea how affected we are, how affected our minds are and have been by sin, and how affected we are by having come through a womb, our mother's womb, where we were conceived in sin and born in sin. I don't think that we can really understand just how much that has affected us. And now that we become Christians, yes, the load of sin is off, and yes, the guilt is gone, and yes, we're on our way to heaven, but I wonder sometime how many times ignorantly we give in to Satan and we give in to his tactics and his strategies in our life, and we don't even know it, unbeknownst to us, we bring those curses a lot of times right back on ourselves with our mouth. Now, I want to make this really clear tonight. I'm not talking about confession. I do believe in the power of confession, but I probably don't believe in it to the extreme as some do. And I'm not condemning them. Maybe I just don't know as much as they know. But I don't believe in the power of confession to the extreme of claim it and, uh, you know, if you name it and claim it, I don't, I don't necessarily go with it that far, although I know there's power in confession. But I'm not talking about confession tonight. I'm talking about with the mouth speaking forth blessings and also with the mouth speaking forth curses and bringing ourselves under curses, unbeknownst to us. And as I go along tonight, uh, we're going to cover a lot of territory, and I'm going to do it as quickly as I can. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, look at my watch real good so everybody can get this out of your system. It's 8.25, and um, I'm going to just look at my watch just to make you feel better, and I'll probably look at it one or two times more in the next two hours. But I am, I'll tell you what I am going to do. I am going to deliver my soul tonight. Because I tell you, I'm seeing some stuff, man. I am seeing some stuff. And I know beyond any doubt that God is about to do a very powerful thing. But just as God is about to do a powerful thing, hell is making his last bid, man. For America and for the peoples of the earth. There's about to be some outstanding, powerful things that's about to happen in the body of Christ. Amen? Now, if you go back in your Bibles, you'll find out all through the Old Testament, and I'm not going to ask you to turn to any particular place while I'm saying this, but all through the Old Testament, you'll find out that the Bible was full of um, people blessing. They blessed their children. 
God blessed Abraham. Abraham blessed Isaac. Isaac blessed Jacob. Jacob blessed his 12 sons. Jacob became the, the father. He was the progenitor of the nation of Israel. From his seed came 12 sons, which became the 12 tribes of Israel. And um, Jacob blessed his sons, and he spoke a blessing even over, we find that blessing resting on Joseph. And then we go all the way down and we see that Jesus blessed. He blessed the bread. He blessed children. He just blessed. And there's, there's some things that you pray over, and the things that you pray over, pray over them. You're supposed to pray over them. But don't pray over things that you're supposed to bless. And don't bless things you're supposed to pray over. A lot of times we close our eyes and pray over something when we ought to be blessing it. And um, there's a difference in praying over something and releasing a blessing on something. Now, before revival broke out here in Brownsville, I came in here and the first time I saw something really break in my life was when I began to speak over what was then as the orchestra pit up there. We don't have it anymore because the church has grown so much we had to take it up because of the growing crowd. And I, I blessed the orchestra pit, boom! I immediately saw a change within 30 days. And nothing had happened over a long period of time. And um, all of a sudden, emerging out of nowhere, came the first trumpet player, and the first news you know, we just had to ask people to not bring their instruments because we didn't have any more room. Then, uh, when the Lord showed me how I had been cursing the orchestra pit, I called it praying, but I was really griping and complaining. How many of you know a lot of times we call it praying, but God says it's griping? How many of you know God's right? How many of you knows that sometimes you've gone in before God too and griped and complained and you called it prayer? The Bible says clearly, enter into his gates with, and his courts with, don't enter into his gates griping and his courts grumbling. You're not going to get anywhere. And I was up there praying, called myself praying, and I was really just sort of sobbing and griping to God that nothing had happened. We built the orchestra pit. I've always wanted brass here, nothing happened. And that night in prayer, it was just like God popped my honey and it just humiliated me and I heard the Lord say to me, well, stop cursing it. And when the Lord said that, it so humiliated me and embarrassed me, I went home. <laughs> I didn't even finish praying. And I went home and I thought it through. And I'm this type of a guy, man, if the Lord pops my honey one time, he won't have to pop it again because I'm going to learn from that first swat. Amen? 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 How many of you, God has to keep swatting you and swatting you? I want the first swat to do the job. Amen? Amen? And so I went home and I began to think, well, cursing it, cursing it. And there's a big difference in cursing something and cussing something. Cussing is profanities. Cursing is speaking something you don't want to see come to pass. Blessing is speaking something you do want to see come to pass. Blessing is not prophesying. I used to somehow read the scriptures and think that when Jacob blessed his 12 sons, he was prophesying over them. Prophecy is prophecy. Blessing is blessing. And you don't prophesy over something when you bless it, and you don't bless something when you prophesy over it. The two are separate. And so, I went home and I began to think, well, if I'm cursing it, how am I cursing it? And then it dawned on me what I was saying in the presence of the Holy Spirit. The next week I came back in here and I stood up in that orchestra pit and I held my hands out like a priest and I blessed the orchestra pit. It was a deliberate, disciplined words that I forced out of my mouth. And when I held my hands up and began to deliberately force words out of my mouth to speak blessings over the orchestra pit, bam, 30 days I saw major change. When I saw that happen, then the Lord spoke to me and he said, I want you to call your family together and I want you to apologize to them for cursing them. 
And I call my family together and I apologize to them for cursing them. And I'm not saying that I was a bad father, a bad husband, but I'm just saying that many times we all, we're human beings and we all have said things over our families that we wish we could recall. And don't sit there and look at me real religious because you're as guilty as I am. And the Lord said, I want you to repent to them and ask them to forgive you and I want you to bless them. And since that time, I have blessed my wife consistently. I have blessed Scott, my oldest son, and I have blessed his wife, and I blessed his children, my grandchildren, and I blessed John Michael, my youngest son, and his wife Elizabeth, and she's expectant now with a baby that's due in the middle of June. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine that, would you? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow. Whoever that was, come up here and sit on the front row. I need your help tonight. <laughs> and, uh, and we have already begun to bless, we have already begun to bless our unborn grandchild. We've already begun to bless him. It's going to be a little boy. Yeah. And we've already begun to bless him. And so I called my family home and I said, I'd like to repent and ask you to forgive me of anything that I've spoken of you in any way as I have maybe cursed you. And sometimes parents, whenever they see something going wrong, husbands, wives, whenever they see something going wrong with each other, our child, sometimes we don't really realize it, but we resort to manipulation and control and when we resort to manipulation and control and get out of faith, trust in the Lord, and we take matters in our own hands, sometime in the dread of seeing how a child is headed, we don't mean to do it, but we actually curse them. You're never going to do so-and-so. You're going to do so-and-so. And we speak that over them, and it's like we're trying to warn them, but we're actually cursing them. The Bible says whatsoever is not of faith is... Say it out loud. Whatsoever is not of faith is, you've got to believe God. You've got to trust God. And you can't take things in your own hands and try to manipulate and control because when you do that, you don't even realize it, but you'll start that cursing business and you'll start saying things that you really don't want to see come to pass. How many of you has ever heard someone say to their child, or maybe you have said it, you're never going to amount to anything. How come you can't be like other young people? How come you can't be like other boys? How come you can't be like other girls? And they do so and so. What's wrong with you? Why can't you do that? You're never going to amount to anything. You're going to do so and so. And you're going to do this. And you start just cursing them, just spewing them and polluting them with curses and you don't really realize that you're doing it. And so I repented, not saying that I said those particular things over my family, because I've always tried to build my family up and encourage them, but I repented. Then I began to bless our home, as I told you, and I began to anoint the doorpost on the house of each room. And I have a blessing that I speak over each room, uh, bathrooms, bedrooms, den, kitchen, etc. I have a copy of that. If you'd like to get a copy, I'll be happy to give you one. I was going to bring it with me tonight, and I forgot it because I, I was going to call the blessings out over the different rooms in our house. And as I begin to bless our home, it's, it's, it's just, I don't know a good word to use here. It was unbelievable the difference that I began to see in our own home as I began to bless our home. I uh, anointed the doorpost going into the den, the wood over the door frame. I anointed it and I began to speak that blessing over the den. I anointed our bedroom, the door going in our bedroom from the hall, and I spoke a blessing over our bedroom. Our sleep became sweeter. The peace just permeated our house like you can't believe. And I blessed the kitchen for fellowship. I blessed the bathrooms for health. 
I bless the bedrooms for rest and for peace, et cetera, et cetera. And as I begin to bless it and begin to get the words out of my mouth into the environment, you see, sometime when you first start something, you quit too soon because you don't see results quick enough. And you quit too soon. But if you keep it up, it's just like the rain when the rain starts coming down and the ground is thirsty, the ground will drink up the rain. But when it keeps raining for a day or two, after a while the ground begins to fill up, then it gets saturated and then you begin to see water standing in your yard. You see what I'm saying? It's the same way when you first start speaking blessings, it's like, <laughs> you just sucked it up and it's gone. And you think that once you do something one time, that's it. That's not true. Atmospheres have to be prepared. Atmospheres in your home must be prepared. Atmospheres in churches must be prepared. And you've got to begin to saturate them with blessings. God knows that many of our churches across America are saturated with curses that people have spoken. Cursing the pastor, not cussing him, but cursing him. Yeah, I remember when our pastor first came, he was a fine guy. Boy, he was on fire. When our pastor first came, he did this and he did that. And then now that the pastor's been there for a while and he's been around your ugly mouth, he's lost heart because he hasn't been blessed too much. He's been cursed in everything he tried to do and he loses heart. And then as he loses heart, you just curse him more. How many of you knows when something starts going wrong, don't curse it, bless it, and it'll reverse it? Amen. Let me say that again. When something starts going wrong, don't curse it. It'll get worse. Start blessing it, and it'll reverse it. It'll pull out of it. Same thing with a child. When you see a child doing something, don't curse him. He'll get worse. It's like you drive a nail into the board and it just keeps going and going and going and you just drove it down. You drove him down. You've cursed him. But if you want to see a child start getting better, start blessing him. Not so much praising him, but blessing the child. And, and, and atmospheres in churches must be, blessings must be spoken over atmospheres in churches. And I begin to do that at Brownsville. And I'm not saying by doing that 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 was the cause of revival. Don't get me wrong. But I'm saying that it had a part. I know it had a part because God was dealing with me about it. And I remember the Lord saying to me, if you'll bless, and if you'll begin to speak blessings over the congregation, if you'll begin to have holy communion every week and speak blessings over the church, he said, I tell you, you'll see a change. And immediately I started coming in the church after I saw the change in the orchestra pit, I saw a change at home. Let me tell you this. Before revival ever broke out at Brownsville, revival first broke out in our home. That was quiet. A lot of people hasn't heard that, but let me say it again. Before revival broke out at Brownsville in the church, it broke out in our home first. As I began to go after God, warning revival at Brownsville, I wasn't sure Brownsville was going to go after God with me. They were wonderful people, and I had a great relationship with Brownsville. But as I began to preach holiness, hunger, intimacy with God, going after God, as I began to preach that, I began to lose some people, and I began to be opposed by some people that I loved. And it was disconcerting to say the least. So I didn't want to tear the church up. I wanted to just get into it easy enough that people could see what God wanted to do without me trying to force anything. But I knew that God wanted to do something. I knew he did. You could feel it. The atmosphere was vibrating with what God wanted to do. But I didn't want to force it because I knew if I forced it, it'd tear the church up. So before revival broke out at Brownsville, it broke out on my back porch at home. And on Friday nights, I would invite some key people over and we would start worshiping God on the back porch and the power of God would fall. 
And the first time I ever heard Lyndall Cooley prophesy, he was laying on the cement on his back, on my back porch, and a spirit of prophecy came on him, and he prophesied for the first time on my back porch before he ever prophesied behind the keyboard in Brownsville. And there were some other people that's here tonight that before they ever felt the presence of God, pow, come down on Father's Day, they felt it in my home. And before God came down on Father's Day of 95, he came down in my house because we were blessing the house. And I remember I'd leave in the morning to go to work and Brenda would be in the chair in the den and I'd come and work, do my thing here at the office, be gone hours, come home. She hadn't got out of that chair all day long. The glory came on her at home. And I, when I came home, there'd be just a wall of Kleenex all around where she had cried all day and been intimate with Jesus all day. And she was still in the chair. At least that's the excuse she used for not cooking supper. And I walked in and I said, oh, baby. She said, it's the Lord. <laughs> and there was just a wall of Kleenex everywhere around her chair. And she'd been crying, you know. And I mean, she couldn't even get up. She, her eyelids were droopy. I tried to hold her up. She couldn't even stand up. And it was just awesome how God came down in our home first. But before I ever started blessing the church, I started blessing our home. And so we had a little bit of head start in our home before we did the church. And then the Lord spoke to me and he said, I want you to go to Brownsville. You saw what happened in the orchestra pit. He said, I want you to start standing over the crowd, uh, standing over the church, over every section of pews while the church is empty and start blessing it. I told you this before and I'm not gonna go through the story again. Started blessing every section of pews. I'd stretch my hands out like a priest over every section of the pews in this church. And as I'd hold my hands up, I would just out of my heart in the dark, speak a blessing over every section of pews. And there were different blessings over every section. I'd go to that section, that section, that section, this section, this section, that section, that section. Go up in the balcony. I don't know, every chair in the choir. And I remember I used to bless the choir like this. I said, Holy Spirit, let sounds come from this platform that will reach the ends of the earth. And I said, let sounds come from this choir where such an anointing will permeate this choir that the nations of the earth will hear the echoes of what you're doing here in this place. Man, I didn't know. I didn't know. I didn't know Lyndall Cooley was going to come. I didn't know Steve Hill was going to be here on Father's Day. I didn't know God was going to put the mix together. Woof! God exploded spontaneously. The choir has been heard to the ends of the earth. The revival has reached the ends of the earth. You never know what you're saying whenever you bless. Amen? But if you move in fear, I said if you move in fear and you speak your fears, you're going to draw a curse. Don't speak things you do not want to see come to pass. Speak those things that you want to see God bring to pass. Speak the things that you desire. Now, let me take you in the scriptures right quick. I've covered enough ground there. I want to show you some powerful things. How many of you know there are invisible forces at work? How many of you know that the things which are visible are temporary and the things which are invisible are eternal? Say that with me. The things that are temporary are visible. The things that are eternal are invisible. There are invisible forces at work right now even as I speak that determines your quality of life, whether good or bad, whether blessings come upon you or whether undesirable things happen to you. And only the Bible, only the Bible, the Holy Word of God, the Scriptures, only the Bible identifies these forces and shows you how to relate to these powers, 
God said there's good, which is blessings, and there's bad, which is curses. There's good, which is life. There's bad, which is death. This is the book that tells you how it works. And God gave you this book because he wanted you to know. You see, God wants you to know that there's more than just Jesus dying on Calvary for your sins. How many of you believe that? He wants you to know how to live in this life. And I want to tell you something. Only this Bible divulges the information about blessings, how to attract them, how to cooperate with them. And only this book divulges the information concerning curses, how to shun them, how to avoid them, and how to stop them in your life. Only this book. As I said a while ago, many pulpits are afraid to deal with it because it's controversial. But I tell you what, friend, I'm concerned enough about the quality of life you're living that we want to wade in the controversial grounds and help you get an understanding so you can live a life of power and victory and peace. Amen? Amen. Now, Scriptures mentions these words, blessings and curses, over 640 times in the pages of the Bible. Over 640 times, the words blessings and curses. It's not only in the Old Testament, but it's in the New Testament. Now, it's interesting that a blessing can affect an individual, it can affect a family, it can affect a tribe, it can affect a nation, and it can affect a church. Let me also say that a curse can affect a family, and curses can affect a tribe, curses can affect a nation, and curses can affect a church. Now, it's interesting. Some blessings are so powerful and some curses are so powerful, they last long past the third and fourth generation. For example, God said to Adam, because you've done this, he said you're going to have to earn your living by the sweat of the brow, and curse it is the ground. And God cursed the ground, and out of the ground came thistles and thorns. And God said, you'll have to live the rest of the days of your life, mankind will, from the fruit of the ground, and you'll have to till the ground, but there's a curse on that ground, thorns and thistles. And you know as well as I do that 2002, to this day, 6,000 years after Adam and Eve, that curse still lasts on the earth to this day because if you don't take care of your yard, if you don't take care of your flower bed, thorns and thistles will come up. Amen? There's a curse on it. Now, blessings work, and they can last past the third and fourth generation also, just like that curse can. God, and even God, let me go back one more time and just tell you this, that God even cursed the serpent. How many of you get the willies when you see a serpent? I get the willies real bad when I see a serpent. And God said you'll have to, you'll have to scoot on the earth, crawl on your belly. And before God did that, the serpent had a different form and a different posture. And the Lord summons him and God cursed him and said, Upon thy belly shalt thou go. And then the Bible says that God put a rainbow in the sky and said, I will not curse the earth again. And he put his bow in the cloud as a promise that his curse would not come upon the earth. Like that, as far as the water is concerned. Now, blessings also have the power and the propensity to last past the third and fourth generation because the blessing that God spoke upon Abraham and the blessing that God spoke about Israel is in force even to this day in 2002 
about 6,000 years after Abraham. And God said, those that bless Israel, I will bless. And God said, those that curse Israel, I will curse. And that still is in effect to this day. And it's multiplied generations down the road from the time God spoke it. So it, that has the power to outlast third and fourth generation. Now there were sins that God's people cre uh, committed that God said, this sin that you have committed has two type roots. How many of you have ever pulled up a, a, a weed out of your flower bed and you saw a tap root on it? Not only did it have a tap root to it, but it had some lateral roots going out like this. A curse is a lot like that. It has a tap root that will go down deep and can affect a lot, even third and fourth generation of course, we're talking about sinners. But it also has lateral roots that will affect that individual in their lifetime. Two kinds of roots, lateral and tap. One goes deep, one is shallow. One will affect the now, the here and now. One will affect generations to come. That is the power that curses have. Now, just for a moment, and I don't want to depress anybody, but I just want to give you this in the way of a warning. I want you to look with me in the book of Deuteronomy concerning blessings and curses. And I want you to look in um, chapter 28 of the book of Deuteronomy. I want to say something before you uh, finish turning. Some of you tonight, while I'm going to be dealing with this subject, some of you is going to become extremely uncomfortable. Some of you is going to become so uncomfortable, you're going to want to jump up and run out of this church. And the devil wants you to jump up and run out of this church because he knows you can find help here. Some of you at home that's listening by radio, some of you that's listening by the internet, and some of you that will get these tapes eventually, when you first start listening to this, the devil's going to do everything he can to distract you because he doesn't want you to hear what I'm going to say because what I'm going to say can greatly help you. Now, one thing I want to establish right up front before I get involved in Deuteronomy is this. I believe when a person becomes a Christian, I've always preached this, always believed this. I believe what I preach and preach what I believe. I don't believe a Christian can be demon-possessed. Don't believe it, have never believed it. I don't believe I'll ever believe that. I believe that they can be oppressed, and I believe they can be harassed, and I believe they can be depressed and different things like that, but I do not believe that a Christian can be demon-possessed. Likewise, I also do not believe that a person that has accepted Christ as their Savior and has pled the blood and accepted the blood and put their faith in the shed blood of Christ, I don't believe that that person is cursed. I believe that they are saved, but I also believe that even after you become saved, you still have a choice. You've got to choose blessing. Because I do believe that after you become a Christian, if you're not educated, and if you don't know better, you can fall right back in the trap of the devil, and as a born-again Christian, start speaking curses, and undesirable things will start happening to you and your family. I believe that. I believe that. But I do not believe that you are cursed. I believe you're washed in the blood and you're ready for heaven, but you're going to have to really be careful with your mouth, in your home, in your church, in every aspect of your life, you'll have to be very careful with your mouth because your mouth is the vehicle that looses either the blessings of God or curses. Your mouth is the vehicle. That's what releases blessings and curses. Now, let me say this also. There's a lot of things I don't understand about 
people that I've even pastored down through the years. And I don't care if it's in Florida or Indiana or Georgia, wherever I pastored, you see the same thing wherever you find humanity. I don't understand how alcoholism travels in bloodlines. I don't understand that. I don't understand how abuse travels in bloodlines. I don't understand how diabetes and things like that travels and is inherited. I don't understand that. And I'm not saying that diabetes is a curse. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying I don't understand really how um, people are recipients of things that's come down from their daddies and their granddaddies and grandmothers and all that, and it shows up in their bodies. I know it's called inherited diseases and I know that today the doctors will say, how did your mother die? Cancer. How did your daddy die? Cancer. Well, you're so many times more likely to die of cancer because your mother died of cancer and your daddy died of cancer. I don't understand those things. I'm not a medical doctor. And I know that medical things figure in there. But I also wonder sometimes how much other things figure in there. Why is it when a man is an alcoholic, why is it many times that his son becomes an alcoholic? Just because the son saw daddy drink it all of his life? I don't think so. Why is it that mother was beaten by daddy and the daughter gets married and he winds up beating her? Why is that? I don't know. I don't have the answers. The only thing I know is my heart is burdened and I hurt and I'm troubled whenever I see those kind of things in families and in bloodlines. I'm troubled by it. And many times I see those kinds of things even in people in churches that professes Christianity. And that's one of the reasons why I believe God began to deal with me as a pastor to begin to educate the congregation about choosing life and choosing blessings. So, just for a moment, I want to delve into some controversial territory, but stay with me. Secularly, let's just, don't, let's just don't even talk about God right now or the Bible or Christianity. Let's just talk about curses, period. How many of you in the house believes that there is such a thing as curses? Can I see your hand, please? How many of you know or believe that you know somebody that possibly is tainted or affected somehow by a curse in their life or their bloodline. Could I see your hand, please? Yeah, almost everybody here. I know that there's been conjecture down through the years about the Kennedy clan, and there's things about that that makes you wonder about Joseph, the father, bringing an alcohol, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not the judge, and I'm glad I'm not. But... Having an inquisitive mind many times, like we all do, we begin to see some of these telltale symptoms which lead you to deduct there's probably something going on there. A lot of times people look to ministers of the gospel as somebody that ought to have all the answers. We don't have all the answers. Only thing is we have the answer and it's Christ Jesus. Amen. I said we have the answer. Don't have all the answers, but we have the answer and Christ is the answer. He's a common denominator that fits in every situation. But I want to say this to you before I delve into this area. If you're here tonight and you call yourself a Christian but you dabble in sin, you're going to have to stop it. Those of you listening to me by radio, and by the internet, those of you listening by tapes, give me your best ear for a few minutes. You're going to have to stop that sin business. Because associated with sin is a curse. And associated with rebellion is witchcraft. And associated with disobedience that we will show you in just a moment from the book of Deuteronomy, disobeying God, disobeying God's known will and God's known plan will bring a curse upon you. I will go even this far to say this that if you don't tithe as a Christian, there's something wrong in your life and it's going to get much more wrong. 
Here's what the Lord said. He said, if you don't tithe, you've robbed me. And he said, if you will honor me with the tithes and offerings and pay them, God said, I will, I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. How many of you knows when God rebukes the devourer, you ain't got a problem? How many of you also knows that the Bible says, submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you? But how many of you know if you don't submit yourself to God and you resist the devil, he's going to sit right there and laugh at you? How many Christians today are plagued by Satan mocking them? Why? Because we have a root problem of rebellion and disobedience against God. And sin will destroy you, friend. And sin opens you up like a walking target, like a walking bullseye for hell to aim at you and to pull you down time and time again. Sin will destroy you. I don't care if you go to church. I don't care if you shout, if you speak in tongues, if you jump as high as those flowers off the floor and whoopee, shout the victory. If you don't obey God, you've got a problem. And I want to tell you something. Your problem is not your wife. Your problem is not your husband. Your problem is not your pastor. And it's not your church. Your problem is your heart is rebellion against God. That's your problem. And I want to tell you something. Nobody is responsible for the quality of life that you live, only you. Because if you keep God's word and do his commandments, God said, I'll bless you. You'll be blessed. Nobody can do it for you, friend. I can't live your life for you. I can't walk your walk for you. You can't walk it for me. But if we'll do what God says, everybody has an unlimited guarantee that God will bless you. And there are certain areas, there are certain areas in people's lives where they are constantly tormented. Now, I believe when you become a Christian and you get saved, the blood cancels the curse and it cancels your sin. But I want to tell you, hell will come and stick his nose up to that soft mud and still try to auger through at times. I believe there's a curse on homosexuals. I believe it. I believe there's a curse on lesbians. I believe there's a curse on adulterers. The Bible says a dart shoots through the liver. I believe there's a curse on people that dishonor their parents. I believe that their days are cut short. You see, friend, there's always a reaction to every action. And there's a cause and effect. And sexual sins is one area where curses work alive, just work alive. And you walk the streets today of America and the world and you see evidently, very evident, lesbians and homosexuals and they're flaunting it, it's in your face and there's never been quite a day like this day on the face of the globe where there's so much homosexual activity and I believe that a lot of that is a curse. The results of a curse. I believe that. I'll tell you what else I believe before I get in the scriptures. I also believe that the occult will bring a major curse on you. The occult. Dabbling in witchcraft. I don't care how minor. I said I don't care how minor. Dabbling in fortune telling. Dabbling in zodiac. Dabbling in new age, playing with crystals, calling a psychic. I'm telling you and I'm warning you. You are opening a door to Satan and a curse will come upon you. And not only you, but your offspring. I don't know if many preachers will tell you that or not, but bless God, you just heard it from one. And I don't back up. It's the truth. <laughs> Hallelujah. Like I told you, some of you right now want to just jump up and run. 
I understand. Go ahead if you need to. We have speakers all outside. I can get you just as I can get you in the earshot. I can get you, friend. A cult will open you up to a curse. God said this. I've been preaching a series here at Browns. We just started it last Sunday. No, I ain't gonna get into that. No, no, I can't. If I get there, I'll never come back. Let's go, let's move on. In Leviticus chapter eight. Keep your finger in Deuteronomy right quick. Go to Leviticus chapter 8. The 10th verse. The Bible says that Moses took the anointing oil and anointed the tabernacle. You know what I'm going to do at the end of the service tonight? For everybody that stays, I'm going to anoint you with oil. I'm going to anoint you with oil, and I'm going to speak a blessing, and we're going to put an end to some stuff tonight. <laughs> Hallelujah. You hear what I'm saying? We're going to anoint you with oil. The Bible says Moses took the anointing oil, and look what it says, and anointed the tabernacle and all the furniture that was therein and sanctified them. And he sprinkled there upon the altar uh, seven times and anointed the altar and all his vessels, both the lever and his foot to sanctify them. And he poured the anointing oil upon Aaron, Aaron's head and anointed him to sanctify him. Now let me explain something to you right quick. Whenever God got Israel out from under bondage and he got them out in the wilderness and God began to explain how he wanted to be worshipped, Moses was the deliverer. His brother Aaron was the high priest. Moses took the oil, anointed Aaron the high priest. He anointed the tabernacle. He anointed the furniture that was therein. He anointed Aaron the priest. And that oil that touched that tabernacle and that oil that touched Aaron sanctified them. And the word sanctify means to set apart to God and to make holy. One of the things that you don't hear much about today in the body of Christ, especially in Pentecostal circles anymore, is the word sanctification. It has almost become a curse word. Now, I know that years ago many people preached saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost like it was a definite work of grace. I'm not talking about a definite work of grace like that, but I'm talking about one of the things that we don't hear much about today anymore is sanctification, where something and someone has been anointed and set apart and made holy and devoted to God. I believe that buildings can be anointed and devoted and set apart to God. I believe that people can. Why do we anoint those going in the ministry? Why do we ordain them and anoint them with oil? We are setting them apart, sanctifying them, and devoting them to be a holy vessel to God. Moses anointed the furniture. He anointed the tabernacle. He made it holy, devoted to God. Same thing with Aaron. And oil was commonly used to impart blessings to kings who to rule on God's behalf. You remember when Samuel the prophet came and he went to Jesse's house and Jesse put all of his sons before Samuel. The Bible says whenever he got through all the boys, he said, is this all you've got? He said, well, I've got one other son. He's out there keeping the sheep. They led Samuel out to David. When he saw David, he said, this is him. And Samuel took the oil, the anointing oil, and he poured the oil on David. He sanctified him, set him apart. Even though Saul was still king and David couldn't become king yet, he sanctified him and devoted him to be the next king, poured oil all over him, and David became holy before God in that moment that Samuel anointed him. And the blessings of God flowed through that oil 
upon that which was sanctified. I want to show you something interesting. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I don't think I've ever covered this ground before at Brownsville, but I want you to follow me tonight closely. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Everybody look this way just for a moment. You know what this is? What is it? Holy Communion. You remember Jesus said to his disciples, he said, I have longed to eat this and to drink this with you. He said, this is a cup of my blood, this is my body, which is broken. But I want you to notice the terminology in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 16. The Apostle Paul writing, look what he called it in verse 16. He said, the cup of blessing which we bless. Is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Look back at verse 16. The cup of blessing. You remember I told you before revival broke out at Brownsville? You remember I told you that the Lord began to speak to me and he said, I want you to speak blessings. And I spoke blessings over my house, orchestra pit, the pews, the choir. I began to bless the congregation every service. I wrote out a blessing and began to speak blessings over the congregation every service. And then the Lord spoke to us through Dick Rubin. Brought us a powerful message about the great high priest. And in that same week after we heard the great high priest, he preached on the importance of communion. And when I sat there on the pew and I heard that message on communion, I heard the Lord say to me, if you'll start having communion weekly in here and saturate the environment with the bread of presence, God said, I'll pour out my presence in this place in an unbelievable way. So here's what happened in Brownsville before revival broke out. Blessings, speaking a blessing over the church, corporately, every week, and I didn't even know it, but when I started taking communion in here, I didn't know this was called the cup of blessing. So see here again, cup of blessing. And you know what? We'll have it this Sunday. And we'll have it next Sunday. Last Sunday we didn't have it because we had a business meeting here last Sunday. But we had it the Sunday before and the Sunday before. And we have it in here almost weekly. Out of 52 weeks a year, we probably don't miss just a few Sundays. And it's called the Cup of Blessing. And this church has been like an old ship. Since revival broke out, it has gone through hell, buddy. It has been through some major hurricanes and major storms. Are you listening to me? It's been through some major storms. But you know what I give credit? I give all the credit to God because this place was saturated with the blessings of God and God kept the old ship afloat. Amen? Amen. Cup of blessing. Speaking of blessing. And blessings have become very predominant here at Brownsville. Now I even speak a blessing over the offering. But there's indications, even secularly, of a curse. Seven indications of a curse, even from a secular point of view, and number one is mental or emotional breakdown. The second indication of a curse is repeated or chronic sickness, even maybe hereditary. Another indication, maybe there's a curse, is barrenness tendency to miscarry, related to barrenness, etc. Fourth indication of a curse, breakdown of marriage and family alienation. Fifth indication of a curse, continuing financial insecurity and continuing poverty. Number six, accident prone. Unexplained accidents happening regularly. Just unexplained. And number seven, history of suicide or early death in a family. Unnatural, early death. Now, this is from a secular point of view. Let's go to the book of Deuteronomy and let me show you what God says about these things. 
Deuteronomy chapter 28. Let's talk about mental or emotional breakdown for a moment. While you're turning, I want everybody to look this way just for a moment. Just for a moment, look this way. I'm not saying if there's one of these things that's happened to you that you're under a curse. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying out of those seven things, if there's a number of those things that is prevalent in your family, prevalent, a number of them, it may be an indication that's where the devil has been trying to work in your family, and I won't call it a curse, I won't venture out and say that, but I'll say if there's a number of those things in your family, your line, your lineage, it could be an indicator something is not right. Now, let's talk about mental or emotional breakdown for a moment. Deuteronomy 28, look at verse 28. We're talking about mental. The Bible says the Lord shall smite thee with madness and blindness, and astonishment of heart. This is part of the curses. God said, for those of you that won't listen to me and you won't obey me, God said, these are the curses that will come upon you. And he's talking to Israel. And he said, the Lord shall smite you with madness and astonishment of heart. Look at verse 34. So that you shall be mad for the sight of your eyes, which you shall see. Look at verse 65. And among these nations shall thou find no ease, neither shall the sole of thy foot have no rest. But the Lord shall give thee there a trembling heart, failing of eyes, and sorrow of mind. Sometime when you see a family that has a history of mental illness and depression and mental breakdown, it can be a sign. Let's talk about repeated chronic sickness such as hereditary things. Look in Deuteronomy 28 and verse 21. It says, The Lord shall make the pestilence cleave unto you until he have consumed thee from off the land where you go to possess it. Verse 22, The Lord shall smite thee with a consumption and with a fever and with an inflammation and with extreme burning, with the sword and with blasting, with mildew, shall they pursue thee until you perish. Look at verse 35. The Lord shall smite thee in the knees and in the legs with a sore botch that cannot be healed from the sole of thy foot to the top of your head. Look at verse 59. Then the Lord will make thy plagues wonderful and the plagues of thy seed even great plagues, long continuant, Sore sicknesses of long continuance. Look at verse 61. Also, every sickness and every plague which is not written in the book of this law, them will the Lord bring upon thee until you be destroyed. Look this way just for a moment. Don't you think it would be really simple after hearing all this to obey God? Wouldn't it be the simple thing to obey God? Who would want this stuff? The Lord said, these are the curses that will come to the disobeyers. Now, let me talk about for a moment barrenness. I won't spend much time on this one. But in chapter 28 and verse 18, it says, cursed shall be the fruit of your body, the fruit of your land, the increase of your kind, and the flocks of your sheep. Cursed shall be the fruit of thy body. Let's talk about breakdown of marriage. Look in chapter 28 and verse 41. God said you will beget sons and daughters, but shall not enjoy them. Oh my God. How many families today, how many husbands and wives today have begat sons and daughters, but have not been able to enjoy them? Look this way, friend. How many dads and moms held that baby so happy, little boy, little girl, but it was only a matter of a little better than a decade and they lost them to hell. 
drug addicts, bound by pornography, taken up in the occult, taken up in cults. And God said they will go into captivity. You will beget sons and daughters, but you won't enjoy them. How many families across America today? Friend, this needs to be preached. I'm telling you, it needs to be preached. How many families in America today are not enjoying their children? And it's a curse. I don't believe it was ever God's will for dad and mom to lose that boy or that girl. I believe that God wants them to be brought up in the house of God, raised up to fear God, and to grow up and be strong and healthy emotionally, physically, and spiritually. And when dad and mom passes off the scene, to pass an inheritance and a posterity on to them and carry out a godly inheritance. Amen. When you fool around, and when you're unfaithful to your wife, and when you play the role of a harlot, and you go whoring after pornography, and you watch it in the bedroom, and you get caught up in X-rated sex, and you have affairs, then you have children. It's just like you're raising them up and handing them to the devil as a living sacrifice to the devil. And hell takes them, and the first news you know, they're not around your table. First news you know, they're not in the bed that you paid for, they're not in their bedroom, they're gone. Here's what the Bible says. It says they'll go into captivity. Oh, my God, the weeping and the lamentations that's heard across America, from Maine to California, and from Florida to Washington. The weeping and the lamentation of parents that are grieving over their prodigal children. But I've got good news for you. God said in the book of Malachi, in the last days, I will send the spirit of Elijah. And he said, I'll return the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers. Devil, you're gonna have to let God's captives go. Are you listening to me tonight? Man, I feel the Lord right now. I believe the spirit of Elijah is about to break forth in a mighty way in America. Stand to your feet right quick. Go! Cooperate with me right now, friend. Help me. Lord, we call the prodigals home tonight in the name of Jesus. We call them home in the name of Jesus. We repent of our sins, Lord. Break forth, Lord, with the spirit of Elijah. Break forth with the spirit of Elijah. 
across America tonight but oh God send the spirit of Elijah send it Lord in this nation in the nations of the world and let it begin to bring the hearts of the fathers and the children back together in the powerful name of Jesus you may be seated I'm hurrying I've been going an hour and five minutes and I know it don't seem like it to me but I'm aware of it. Number five, continuing financial insufficiency. We find that in Deuteronomy chapter 28 and look at verse 17. It says, curse shall be your basket and curse shall be your store. Look at verse 29. And, the, and you shall grope at noonday as the blind gropes in darkness, and they, you shall not prosper in your ways. And you shall be only oppressed and spoiled evermore, and no man shall save thee. Look at verse 47. Because you serve not the Lord thy God with joyfulness and with gladness of heart for the abundance of all things, therefore you shall serve your enemies, which the Lord shall send against you in hunger and in thirst, in nakedness and in one of all things and shall put a yoke and iron upon your neck until he has destroyed thee. I want to show you something interesting about verse 47. Look at this, please. It says, because you serve not the Lord thy God with joyfulness and with gladness of heart for the abundance of all things. In other words, if you serve God with joyfulness and gladness of heart, he said, you'll have abundance of all things. But look at verse 48. All these things that's mentioned here is poverty. It says hunger. What's hunger? It's poverty. Thirst, poverty. Nakedness, poverty. One of all things, poverty. And shall put a yoke of iron upon your neck until it shall have destroyed thee. I don't have time to keep going. There's two more here, but I'm not going to cover them. The other one is accidents, and the other one is suicides and unnatural early and timely deaths. I don't, don't have time to get into that. But let me just give you a compilation, two categories. The list of blessings are seven in the Bible. Here they are. Exaltation, health, reproductive, prosperous, victory, God's favor, and abundance. Here's nine curses God said would come upon you if you disobey him. There's seven blessings and nine curses. The first curse is humiliation. The second one is barrenness, unfruitfulness. The third one is mental and physical breakdown. The fourth one is family breakdown. Fifth one is poverty. Sixth one is defeat. Seventh is oppression. Eighth is failure. And the ninth is God's disfavor. Now, let me share something with you. Have you ever noticed where God said, if you'll obey me, I'll make you the head and not the tail? You know what that means? Have you ever thought about it? The head makes decisions. The tail gets kicked. The tail just gets drug around. The tail gets drug around whichever way the head says to go. Amen? Look at a lizard turn. When a lizard turns, his whole tail turns. The tail turns in conjunction with the head. God said, I'll make you the head where the decisions are made, where you have a say, where you have a voice, and where you have decisions. Where there's power. But if you're not, God said, 
you'll be the tail. If you don't obey me, you'll be the tail. Just drug around and kicked all the time. And then something else I like, let me show it to you right quick. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 13. Look at this. It says, make you the head, not the tail, and you shall be above only and shall not be beneath. If you hearken to the commandments of the Lord thy God, which I command thee this day. Look at it. It says, you shall be above only and not beneath. Look this way for a moment. You know what that means? Have you ever said to somebody, how you doing? Well, under the circumstances, I'm doing all right. You know what that means? You're not where you ought to be. You ought to be above your circumstances. Are you listening to me? God said you ought to be above it. God said you ought to be on top. He said you'll be above and not beneath. Many of God's people live defeated lives underneath circumstances and life pressing them down. But God said if you'll obey me, I'll keep you above it all and you won't be beneath it. And I'll make you the head and not the tail. I don't have time, man, I've, I've left out pages of notes tonight, but let me just go ahead and cover one other area with you real quick. I'm amazed at churches that doesn't have a heart for Israel. I'm amazed at people that fights God's people Israel. I'm amazed at churches that you couldn't, they, they don't believe that Israel is God's holy people, God's chosen people. They don't believe it. I know preachers that get behind their pulpits in Pentecostal pulpits across this nation and preaches that Israel is not God's chosen people, that they're a secular society, they're not God's chosen people, and they just totally disregard that scripture where God said, those that bless thee I will bless and those that curse thee I will curse. I cringed when I saw Louis Farrakhan say what he did about the Jews. Anytime a man gets up and curses the Jews, watch him, mark him, and just watch him. He's coming down real soon. And Farrakhan almost died. He's been seriously ill. He's almost died. One of the greatest curses of our age, especially in European churches, European churches are worse about it than American churches. They don't want to hear nothing about the Jews. They don't want to hear nothing about blessing Israel and cursing Israel. They don't want to hear none of that stuff, especially European churches. But God plainly says, listen, I may not claim to be the smartest man in the world, but friend, I know the Bible whenever I read the Bible. And God said to Abraham, those that bless you, I will bless them, and those that curse you, I'll, I'll curse them. The first $10,000 check that I was ever privileged to write out in my ministry at Brownsville, I came here when I was 31 years old. We were still over in the chapel, and I had Jan William Vanderhaven come from Jerusalem. And he was with the International Christian Embassy of Jerusalem, ICEJ. And when I was about 32 years old, I had him come. And the first check that I was ever able to write out from any church that I ever pastored in my life, first $10,000 check I was able to write out to the Jews, a ministry to the Jewish people, International Christian Embassy of Jerusalem. And I wrote it out and gave it to Jan William Vanderhaven for their ministry there in Jerusalem. From that time, God began to bless this church. From that time. I could, listen, there's pivotal moments when things happen in my life. I can take you back to pivotal moments in my diaries. I can take you back. I can take you back to the day when that check was written, the Sunday that it was written. I was about 32 years old. This church was running a little bit better, better than 300 people at that time. Boom! We wrote that check out for $10,000. The blessings just started coming like crazy. Signs and wonders started breaking out. Church started growing like crazy. To this day, you see a banner up on that platform that says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. The Messianic people and the Jewish nation will always be intertwined in Brownsville as long as I'm here. It'll always be intertwined in Brownsville as long as I'm here. 
Always will be. As a matter of fact, this year we're going to have a conference, a Messianic conference. Brownsville's going to put on just a Messianic conference, and we're inviting only Messianic speakers to come, Jewish people to come. We're going to host it here in this church this year. Hallelujah. I want to close. I don't have time to go any further, but listen. Here's what happens. God even said, I'll bless Sarah, your wife. He didn't say, I'll heal her. He said, I'll bless her. Did you know by blessing God, the Bible says in Psalms 103, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. It says, who forgiveth all thy iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who renews thy youth. By blessing God, it renews thy youth. And did you know whenever God blessed Abraham, because Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek, gave a tenth of all he won from the spoils of war, he paid tithes to Melchizedek. God found a man that put his son, Isaac, on the altar, offered him up. When God got ready to deliver Israel from Egyptian bondage, he sent Moses in there. And he told Moses, he said, tell Pharaoh to let my firstborn go. When Israel went into Egypt, there were 70 of them. When Moses was sent in to get them out, 400 and something years later, 430 years later, there was two and a half million of them. They grew from 70 to two and a half million. And when there was two and a half million, God still called the whole group my firstborn son. And he said, Moses, tell Pharaoh, let my firstborn go. And if he don't do it, tell him I'll kill the firstborn of every house in Egypt. I'll kill the firstborn of every cow, every sheep, every living animal, and every family will lose their oldest child if they don't let my firstborn go. Seventy grew to two and a half million, and God still called him his firstborn. The blessings of the Lord traveled all the way down. Abraham, Isaac, the same blessing that was on Abraham wound up on Isaac. Isaac transferred it to Jacob. Jacob transferred it to Joseph. The Bible says that God prospered all that Potiphar had because Joseph was in his house and just travels right on down. And then the Bible says in the book of Galatians that because of Christ dying on Calvary, it said now the Gentile church is also now the seed of Abraham. And here's the good news I want to close with tonight. Whether you realize it or not, the Lord has sent me here to tell you, if you're just expecting things to overtake you, it don't work like that. You've got to choose them. You've got to choose them. As a matter of fact, turn to James chapter 3. This is my last scripture, and I'm closing. <clears throat> James chapter 3. Look at verse 10. Well, let's go back to verse 8. The Bible says, But the tongue no man can tame. It is unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, curse we men, made out of the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceeds blessings and curses. My brethren, these things are not to be so. The Bible says, Out of the same mouth proceed. Look this way. Out of the same mouth proceed blessings and curses. Some people wonder why do such things happen in my life. Take an account tonight and just think how many times you're loosing curses out of your mouth. Saved, yes. On the way to heaven, yes. But ignorant. Out of your mouth, you're releasing curses. Sometimes you speak blessings. But sometime when it really feels good and it's convenient, you'll speak curses just as easily as you speak blessings. And your life is a mixture. Ups, downs, ins, outs. Excited, depressed. And that's why the apostle said, these things ought not to be. Out of the same mouth, it said, the same mouth, you speak blessings and curses. And it said, these things ought not to be. 
And I want to tell you this, you are the seed of Abraham, and because you're the seed of Abraham now, and because of Christ dying on Calvary, the blessings of Abraham, God has fixed it where the blessings of Abraham now, because of Calvary and because of the shed blood of Jesus, can now come upon you. But you've got to choose them. You've got to call them in. You've got to choose them. And I want to warn you, friend, stop this business of speaking curses. Stop this depression business. Stop this heavy oppression and speaking those things that are just make you feel good, make people feel sorry for you, and make you look pitiful, and make you, you, people want to give you sympathy. Stop that. You're cursing yourself. How many times do females curse themselves? I hate my body. I hate my lips. I hate my hair. I hate my legs. I hate my breast. I hate them. If I had the money, I'd do this and I'd do that. And I wish God done this and I wish God done that. You're cursing yourself. Is it any wonder sometimes why you suffer along those lines? Because you're cursing yourself. You need to look in that mirror and say, oh, glory to God, thank you, Jesus. Yeah. Amen. You ought to look in that mirror and say, hmm, mm, mm. My God, my eyes can see. My limbs can move. I can walk. I can talk. I can taste food. I can sleep. My heart beats, glory to God. My brain functions. Yes. You ought to just bless yourself. Woo! Woo! Stand up, everybody. Hallelujah. Come on. Bless the Lord. you, Lord. You're a good God. You've been so good. Hallelujah. Now, I want to do something before you leave tonight. We're going to receive the offering. And tonight, this offering goes to Brownsville. Usher's going to bring out the buckets. You can be seated if you want to make out your check and all that, but don't leave. Because I want to have an opportunity to anoint you tonight, and I want to bless you. Personally, I want to bless you. Amen? We're going to end the service tonight a little bit different. But I want everybody in this house to be anointed, and I want to bless you before you leave. Hallelujah. Just sit down and get your wallets, get your checkbook, get your cash. Come on, I want you to bless the Lord tonight. The brethren are going to bring out the buckets. Worship team is going to come back, and we're going to worship for a few minutes. But don't leave me, church. I want to bless you tonight. Hallelujah. 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 Everybody get your checks ready.